Hello, and welcome to the Drug Discovery World podcast, a podcast covering topics around drug discovery and development, pharma, and biotech. My name is Giles, and I'm here to take you through this episode. Today's episode is taken from the current Summer 2020 issue, and is part one of two episodes, titled Race to COVID-19 Cure, the core model for solving the pandemic crisis. This article was written by Ibis Sanchez Serrano and Ratnam Chagaturu, and will be giving their full author bios at the end of part two in the next episode. So now onto the main article, Race to COVID-19 Cure, the core model for solving the pandemic crisis, part one. Mitigation of COVID-19 pandemic requires a combination of effective epidemiological policies and the discovery and development of powerful drugs against the severe acute respiratory syndrome, coronavirus 2, SARS-CoV-2, that causes this disease. This two-part episode series examines the major initiatives being explored at the public policy level to contain the spread of COVID-19, as well as some of the most important innovative collaborative efforts at the research and development front to combat SARS-CoV-2. For a successful outcome, these efforts need a proven and effective organization model. The core model, a collaborative paradigm and economic theory based on the structured collaboration between specific public and private sectors in society, is one such model to help alleviate the crisis. The core model could be strategically instrumental in bringing partners with a common goal from the public and private sectors with complementary technologies, learnings, expertise, and infrastructure together under one single and focused enterprise, the International COVID-19 Initiative, an unprecedented centralized stewardship fostering global collaboration to combat the global pandemic. SARS-CoV-2 could very well be nicknamed the virus of truth, for it has exposed the best and the worst sides of humanity. On one side, it has brought many people together through love, solidarity, altruism, compassion, cooperation, responsibility, and other commendable virtues. On the other, it has brought division through open demonstrations of hatred, selfishness, greed, corruption, irresponsibility, and other condemnable human traits. SARS-CoV-2 is responsible for the greatest pandemic the world has experienced since the 1918 flu pandemic caused by the influenza A virus subtype H1N1, AH1N1. First reported in the city of Wuhan, Hubei Province, China, in December 2019, the origin of SARS-CoV-2 is still being debated. Though not nearly as mortiferous as the 1918 flu pandemic, COVID-19 has created enough devastating damage across the world to make us reconsider the way we are living as a human society and question the actual values and even worthiness of our political and socio-economic systems and leaders. COVID-19 has humiliated wealth, power, and science. It has humbled the most powerful nations in the world and exposed to the world their unsuspected weaknesses. To many people, it may seem incredible that in a period of history with the greatest wealth, means of communication, access to information, and most importantly, scientific and technological advances driven by countries that are powerhouses of biomedical research, such as the United States and some European nations, we are unable to find a quick cure for COVID-19. Interestingly enough, in four decades of investing billions of dollars in research, and 23.6 to 43.8 million deaths, we still have not been able to find a vaccine for HIV or AIDS either. In fact, we become surprised every day by a new characteristic of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, or by a new manifestation of COVID-19. Not even the most promising and well-funded projects could guarantee the discovery and development of an effective vaccine in 18 to 24 months to combat the deadly SARS-CoV-2 virus. From an economic perspective, COVID-19 has launched the world into the greatest recession ever since the 1929 Great Depression. It is estimated that by next year, this pandemic would have cost the world at least 8.8 trillion US dollars, or 10% of the world's gross domestic product. At present, there are more than 9 million people infected by SARS-CoV-2, and at least 470,000 mortalities 
in the 213 countries and territories that have been affected by it. These numbers, last accessed on the 22nd of June 2020, are changing as tracking modalities get better, and the listener is advised to visit coronavirus.jhu.edu slash map.html for the most up-to-date information. Such devastating death and destruction will continue to increase dramatically until a vaccine and or effective treatments are developed, approved, and distributed worldwide. In the meantime, human society is living in total uncertainty, fear, anxiety, and anguish, which will be reflected in massive current and post-traumatic depression, especially in the case of healthcare workers, public order officers, decision makers, and the at-risk population. Incalculable economic hardship, due to the loss of employment, income, savings, and investment, that millions of people in the planet are facing, will continue to grow in the near future and beyond. Countries such as the United States, Italy, Spain, France, the United Kingdom, Iran, Brazil, Mexico, Ecuador, and Russia are among the hardest hit by this pandemic. Some models, in fact, are trying to predict what could happen in the worst case scenario, the one in which no vaccine is ever developed, and the virus is left to run freely until it infects 60 to 90% of the world's population and no longer represents a threat to human health, a phenomenon called herd immunity. Because of SARS-CoV-2's high contagiousness, and the fact that we still neither have enough knowledge about its behaviour, nor have we any adequate treatment available, not even the worst thinkable nightmare could provide a glimpse of what would happen in the world if such a scenario becomes our nightmare. It is projected that a single symptomatic SARS-CoV-2 infection would cost, in the United States alone, a median of 3,045 United States dollars in direct medical costs incurred only during the course of the infection. If 20% of the United States population were to become infected, there would be a median of 11.2 million hospitalizations, 2.7 million intensive care unit ICU admissions, 62.3 million hospital bed days, and 1.6 million ventilators used, costing the United States $163.4 billion. In a similar fashion, if 80% of the US population became infected, this could result in a median of 44.6 million hospitalizations, 10.7 million ICU admissions, 6.5 million ventilators used, and 249.5 million hospital bed days, costing the United States $654 billion in direct costs over the course of the pandemic. These numbers alone, not even considering the death tally, and all the ramifications and domino effects of such a disaster on other sectors clearly tell us that the potential cost of simply reopening the economy too early, or of letting the virus run its course without any major intervention, the herd immunity approach, could be devastating for the United States, a country that has not been able to cope adequately with this pandemic. Can we imagine extrapolating this to the rest of the world? On December 31st, 2019, Chinese authorities reported to the World Health Organization, WHO, China Country Office, that they were treating 44 patients with pneumonia of unknown cause in Wuhan City, Hubei Province. On January 2nd, 2020, the WHO activated the Incident Management System across the three levels of WHO, Country Office, Regional Office, and Headquarters. Soon after, in mid-January, Wuhan exported cases were identified in Thailand, Japan, South Korea, and the United States. On January 30th, 2020, the WHO declared the COVID-19 outbreak a public health emergency of international concern. On February 23rd, a surge of cases was reported in Italy, and immediately after, in Iran, South Korea, and Japan. Cases began to be reported in other parts of Europe, Canada, the Sub-Saharan region, Latin America, and the rest of the world. On March 11th, 2020, the WHO announced that COVID-19 had become a pandemic. From the very beginning, the WHO made recommendations to China, then to other countries, to take preventative, basic hygiene measures to contain the epidemic, such as hand washing, mouth covering when coughing, maintaining physical distance, wearing a face mask in public settings, and monitoring and quarantine, self-isolation, for suspicious cases of infection. Authorities from all over the world responded to the WHO recommendations, even though there were many points of confusion and contention, for instance, whether to wear masks in public or not. 
As the virus began to spread within borders, most countries implemented travel restrictions, lockdowns, controls of potential workplace hazard, and closures of facilities. Some countries were stricter than others with their lockdowns. A few, such as the UK and Sweden, decided not to act in the hope that herd immunity would develop among the population. The UK backtracked from this approach in mid-March, early April 2020, but too late. As of June 2020, the UK had the third highest overall number of deaths in the world, and the fifth highest amount of infected people. Sweden experienced the surge of unexpected deaths in the months leading up to May 2020, confirming that such an approach would be very deadly. Panama, being Latin America's maritime, air traffic, and banking hub, implemented one of the strictest lockdowns in the continent, and one of the most creative ones on the planet, thus making headlines around the world. As a result of this unorthodox, gender-based plan, according to the Panamanian Ministry of Health, the basic reproduction number, R0, that is, the expected number of cases directly generated by one case in a population where all individuals are susceptible to infection, fell below one by the end of April, and the lockdown restrictions began to be lifted gradually. To give a bit more information on the lockdown and the successful Panamanian perspective, citizens are allowed two hours to buy groceries or medicines based on the last number of their ID and according to sex. Women allowed to exit their homes for two hours at a specified time during the day based on the last digits of their ID number on Monday, Wednesday and Friday. Men allowed to leave their homes again at a specified time for two hours during the day based on the last digit of their ID on Tuesday, Thursday and Saturday. No one could exit their homes on Sunday, unless with special permit due to the indispensable nature or their job. Minors remain at home at all times. People over 60 were encouraged to do so as well. No alcohol was to be sold at all in the entire country during the lockdown. And finally, during some weekends, neither men nor women could exit their homes. Unfortunately, the original success of this approach has become compromised recently by corruption scandals and the lack of discipline, among other important factors, by some parts of the population once the restrictions began to be lifted. As a result, the R0 and the COVID-19 cases and deaths began to increase rapidly in June 2020. This is a clear demonstration and warning that even the most creative and effective measures to control COVID-19 during a lockdown could become threatened if the most vulnerable sectors of society are not sufficiently attended if testing falls short, if all the elements of society are not well aligned and organized, etc. Other Latin American countries, such as Costa Rica, El Salvador, Uruguay, Paraguay, Cuba, and Colombia, also took very strict measures to contain the virus, with much success. In Europe, Germany became a leader on how to deal with the situation, while Australia and New Zealand, thanks to apt leadership, succeeded quickly in flattening the curve. In other words, spreading the number of infections a long time as to avoid overwhelming the healthcare system. A bit of information about New Zealand. Mitigation versus elimination. New Zealand pursued a strict elimination approach, a vastly different approach to usual pandemic planning. They implemented a full lockdown involving the closure of schools and non-essential workplaces, a ban on social gatherings and severe travel restrictions, enabling the country to consider elimination. The rules were communicated effectively. The lockdown was swift and tough. They followed the World Health Organization advice around mass testing and robust contact tracing, key to limiting the death toll. They allowed the country to get key systems up and running to effectively manage borders and carry out contact tracing, testing, and surveillance. And they had centralized leadership in pandemic planning and execution. The response in New Zealand has been one that placed science, leadership, and careful language at the forefront. The biggest benefits of pursuing an elimination strategy are few cases of infection and few deaths, and businesses back up and running. New Zealand's economy would now operate at just 3.8% below normal. Some countries have been able to provide their citizens and corporations some types of financial aid and loans, and, in the case of individuals or population at risk, food, shelter, and medicines. Others have failed terribly at this, exacerbating the burden of the pandemic. In the United States, despite its provision of relief aid, the situation has been quite chaotic. The rate of unemployment has soared, and the number of deaths is higher than any country in the world. 
Unfortunately, many countries did not have sufficient personal protective equipment, ventilators, or adequate infrastructure to protect their healthcare workers and general population. Nor were they able to carry out sufficient SARS-CoV-2 diagnostic tests. In an ideal situation, a country such as the United States should carry out approximately 900,000 COVID-19 tests on a daily basis. But at present, as of the time of this article, it was only able to perform around 300,000 tests at the national level at best. This has enormous implications in the process of reopening the economy and to contain the spread of the disease. COVID-19, prevention versus treatment. In the midst of a societal upheaval resulting from the SARS-CoV-2, there have been many efforts in progress to find solutions to slow the spread of the disease and treat those who already have it. These efforts include those from governments, non-profit organizations, and corporations, both privately held and publicly traded. The race for COVID-19 cure is two-pronged, prevention, treatment, or both. Under normal circumstances, vaccine development, licensure, and manufacturing are processes that can take several years to complete. Most coronavirus vaccines are intended to force the body's immune system to make antibodies that latch onto the spike protein on the surface and to kill the virus. At present, and at the time of this article, there is not a single vaccine or drug approved by the FDA against COVID-19. According to Faster Cures at the Milken Institute, at the time of this article, there are about 169 vaccines in development in nine different platforms, and approximately 254 COVID-19 treatments under consideration. To expedite development and distribution of a SARS-CoV-2 vaccine, unprecedented international alliances have been formed, and billions of dollars have been allocated. At present, there are approximately 10 of the most promising candidates in one of the four phases of clinical trials. Attempts to address the tsunami of COVID-19 in either direction of treatment or prevention requires a strategic approach in tandem, sequential or parallel. Both have merits, but a parallel approach is the need of the hour. Vaccine for prevention and treatment to contain SARS-CoV-2's infection progress. Since vaccine development is in itself a lengthy process of many steps, testing, producing, and licensing, that are traditionally sequential, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovation, CEPI.net, proposes a truncated parallel process for COVID-19 vaccine development, even before knowing the vaccine will work. Regarding the development of a vaccine, the fundamental question toggles between when or if. In spite of Herculean efforts, no vaccine has ever come to fruition against viruses that cause severe acute respiratory syndrome, SARS, and Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, MERS. Among others in development or consideration, pioneering DNA and RNA-based platforms offer enormous hope. Moderna Therapeutics, Cambridge MA in the United States, uses RNA technology, while Anovio Pharmaceuticals, Plymouth Meeting, PA, United States, has developed DNA technology to package the genetic code of coronavirus spike proteins, which make up the crown around the virus and help it to latch onto cells. This approach has the advantage of being able to move to trials faster than vaccines that require the production of viral proteins or a weakened version of the actual virus to induce an immune response. The DNA technology is still unproven, and there are no approved RNA vaccines to date. And that is the end of part one of the two-part episode series, Race to COVID-19 Cure, the core model for solving the pandemic crisis. The next episode will be containing part two, and we'll also go through the authors of this episode at the end of part two. If you've enjoyed this episode, then you can subscribe to Drug Discovery World free of charge by visiting our website at ddw-online.com, where you can also view all of our articles, including references and images, and download the original PDFs. The links are in the show notes. If you've enjoyed the podcast, then do leave us a review and subscribe, and you can also follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter. Thank you for listening, and we'll hope to see you in our next episode.